greatest entrepreneur that Singapore has seen is Dr. Goh. He was very much ahead of his time. Dr. Goh was someone who could come up with fresh ideas, fresh insights. Dr. Goh has a sense of mission. When he felt that something had to be done, he would do it. I had no initial vision. You just started and hope for the best. <laughs> if you have a vision, that means you're a dreamer. I'm not a dreamer. He may not have been a dreamer, but many will say Dr. Goking Sui was a visionary. And it was his unseen hand which had helped build Singapore. When Dr. Goh left politics in 1984, then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew wrote in tribute, a whole generation of Singaporeans take their present standard of living for granted because you had laid the foundations of the economy of modern Singapore. Some years ago, the Prime Minister told me that Dr. Go would be retiring at the end of this term and asked me to try and persuade him to stay on. I did not because I think Dr. Go has done more than enough for Singapore. But Dr. Go wasn't just Singapore's economic and social architect. He also played a significant role in Singapore's political destiny, the full extent of which was unknown even to former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew for 30 years after independence. Go Keng Sui, was born on 6 October 1918 to a middle-class family in Malacca, Malaya. He came to Singapore at the age of two and was later educated at the Anglo-Chinese school before going to study economics at Raffles College. It was as a tutor at Raffles College that he first met Lee Kuan Yew. He worked as a civil servant till World War II came to Singapore with the Japanese occupation. Experience is a harsh school, but for Gokeng Sui, who wrote these words in 1977, the years under colonial rule were the harder teacher. The promising civil servant had carried out a social survey of Singapore. His experience led to a deep disgust at the incompetence of the island's colonial rulers. He found poverty and squalor were the order of the day, with eight in ten households living in one room or less than. He railed against this, even in an interview 40 years on. The British had no business to run Singapore. They were incompetent. They were incompetent. The people over you, they knew nothing. After the war, a scholarship took him to the London School of Economics. His political awakening came during a trip to Hungary for the World Federation of Democratic Youth Meeting. And it was in Britain that he started the pro-independence Malayan Forum with other student leaders from Singapore and Malaya. Amongst them were Lee Kuan Yew and To Chin Chai. Together, they went on to found the People's Action Party in 1954. After obtaining his PhD on a University of London scholarship in 1956, Dr. Goh rejoined the civil service, but not for long. He quit to contest the 1959 Legislative Assembly election on a PAP ticket. His motivation, he said, was to get rid of the British. A new phase in his life had begun. For more than 30 years ago, a group of returned students looked at colonial Singapore and decided that they had a mission to change a the system. Then they applied the lessons they learned in British universities, set about building a trade union following, and in 1954 formed the People's Action Party. It was an act of reckless folly. 
Mercifully for them and for Singapore, they did not receive the punishment they richly deserved. But history was to prove that that was no act of reckless folly. That year, the PAP was victorious in the country's first general election. Self-government had become a reality, and with it, the task of building a new nation from scratch. Providing jobs and housing a people were pressing demands. Labor unrest was common. It was also the start of a decade-long battle with the communists and winning over the unemployed who were susceptible to communism. I was fortunate in that I had a very good, very strong colleague in Dr. Go King Sui. So I appointed him finance minister because that was the most important portfolio. If we don't get the finance right, then nothing else can be done. I'm damned if I knew anything about, uh, you know, running a country different from reading economic textbooks. Uh, fortunately, I knew the ambassador uh, to, of Israel who was then posted in Bangkok. And uh, I told him, look, let me spend some time in your country. Have a look at uh, how you set up industries, because at that time, Israel was really good. The only economist in this first Singapore cabinet, Dr. Goh's strategy was to build a manufacturing sector to attract foreign multinational corporations to invest and so provide jobs very quickly. Well, he was, I would say, a bit, uh, very much ahead of his time. He welcomed foreign investments. And that, at that time, the mood was fearful. Uh, people were, f a lot of nations were frightened of MNCs. They thought they were exploiters, they were uh, imperialist front organizations. But Dr. Goh was very sure that they would do more good than harm on balance, that they would provide markets for Singapore. In 1961, Dr. Goh set up the Economic Development Board with the sole objective of attracting foreign MNCs here. Jurong was part of that strategy. Jurong, a name that will make Singapore famous in a new way. 15,000 acres of swamp would be turned into a modern industrial park. They were full of uncertainties. Dr. Goh himself openly admitted when he started uh, Jurong, he said, uh, this is an act of faith. And uh, he himself uh, jokingly said that uh, this could prove to be uh, Goh's folly. Uh, he himself said that. Uh, but he persevered. There were, there were many, many problems. First of all, you know, Jurong is, uh, was a swamp. Uh, you had to create the factories there, and you had to get workers to live there. It was a big, big uh, uphill battle to persuade people to uh, go there. I mean, at that time, uh, people you know, had little knowledge of industry. And... Uh, they were naturally quite sceptical, uh, but we don't care. We just press on. And press on he did. When nobody wanted to move to the new frontier town, Dr. Go ordered the installation of toll gates on the main road leading into Jurong. The message got through. It would be cheaper for workers to live in Jurong instead of being bused to the factories each day. People began moving in and Jurong began to boom. By 1968, over 150 factories were operating here, and the toll was never imposed. Dr. Goh had played hardball and won, but he was just as hard on himself. Despite a strong personal aversion to publicity, he actively opened and visited factories, making speech after speech, a personal touch which helped to win over investors. And the MNCs and workers came, but soon, another hurdle appeared. Dr. Goh had counted on a common market with Malaysia because of 